Warm greetings to you. I'm happy to welcome you to this service for the eighth Sunday after Pentecost, beginning in the prayer book on page 355. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Gloria. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, and the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, you know our necessities before we ask, and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion on our weakness, and mercifully give us those things which for our unworthiness we dare not, and for our blindness we cannot ask. Through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Genesis. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran, he came to a certain place and stayed there for the night, because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called that place Bethel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 139, 1 through 11 and 22 through 23 is found in the prayer book on page 794. Psalm 139, 1 through 11, 22 through 23, page 794. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my journeys and my resting places and are acquainted with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips, but you, O Lord, know it altogether. You press upon me, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain to it. Where can I go from your spirit? 
Where can I flee from your presence? If I climb to heaven, you are there. If I make the grave my, my bed, you are there also. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me and the light around me turn to night, darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light to you are both alike. Search me out, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my restless thoughts. Look well whether there be any wickedness in me and lead me in the way that is everlasting. Our second reading is from Romans chapter 8, 12 through 25. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if, in fact, we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God, for the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Another parable Jesus put before the crowds, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field, but while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him, saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. When's the last time you said to yourself, said to yourself that just is not right? I'm talking about our reaction to some terrible situation, some unfairness, some inhuman cre uh, cruelty. You feel anger or sorrow or an aching sense of bewilderment over the indignity done, the sheer wrongness. And it doesn't help that the news today sometimes seems downright apocalyptic with soaring temperatures, with uh, breaking records, wilting people's souls. Sometimes we worry or get discouraged. Our, our communities are divided, at odds. That's not how things are supposed to be, right? And the Old Testament, as it turns out, is full of protests with God about the wrongness of oppression and injustice. Sometimes you can just about picture the psalmists shaking their fists with frustration. Or maybe some days the people of Israel wanting simply to retreat and escape reality. The Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans, which we've just heard, sometimes gets a bad rap for being hard to understand. And it's true that in places, Paul's vision of faith soars to lofty heights, like it might, might be just, just out of the reach of our comprehension. It is in this letter that he uses, well, words like justification, sanctification, pulling in elaborate arguments from Old Testament figures like Abraham. Paul talks about living according to the flesh, like he does in, this, in today's reading. What does, what does that mean? And he calls readers to put to death the deeds of the body vocabulary we may not be much used to. Sometimes Paul's thought takes work, but there are places 
There are places in Paul's epistle where Paul describes our human situation so well that we readily understand him. We instantly identify. Today's reading is one such case in point where Paul says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves groan inwardly. There's that feeling of things not the way they're supposed to be. Paul says poetically with vivid images what we all know viscerally, what we all sense and feel in our gut, that things go badly, sometimes heartbreakingly wrong, that as the New Testament scholar and Anglican bishop N.T. Wright puts it, we feel that the world needs to be put to rights, the wrongs reversed, that sometimes as 17th century writer John Bunyan put it, our prayers have more groans than words. For sometimes life hurts, it hurts while you wait, it hurts to wait, Sometimes we yearn for the new life that we think we're promised, that we believe will come. And we look around some days, and we have to wonder why the promise, why the promised fulfillment seems to tarry. Well, Paul latches on to that feeling. He says that while as Christians we experience the great joy of new life, Paul at times just effervesces with joy. He talks about life as the anticipation of a child in a womb. But we also know that accompanying that can be struggle. The birth process comes with pain. Delivering a child, after all, is called labor. And that reality hits us in our, well, in our earliest days. Even children know that know that reality of injustice. They get bullied or hit or hurt on the playground. They become aware of the hardness of the world. Maybe a parent or a caregiver proves untrustworthy or hurts them. Youth and young adults, they have their challenges too, a higher rate of depression and anxiety than ever before. They're, they're worried sick. Then later in life, there's maybe the reckoning of midlife, some of its challenges, or, or the diminishments of aging. So Paul talks about all of creation participating in the not rightness of things. The whole of creation becomes personified as though it shares with us in our everyday sorrows, in our global anxieties as though not only nations and peoples, but also trees and oceans and mountains participate in the brutal reality of this imperfect world, this fragile island home, as the Eucharistic prayer puts it. Now, some of what confronts us is humankind's inhumanity to itself. Do you think humanity is progressing? I don't think so. In the last century, in the 20th century, more people died by violent means than all the previous centuries combined. We're capable of unthinkable evil. So we groan in Paul's simple but memorable word. We groan over how cruel people can be to one another, to us. Sometimes, how cruel we can be to them. Well, Jesus had something to say about God and the existence of evil and how it's all intertwined in this world. We live in this world we love and yet also sometimes walk through way down. He talks about God and the existence of evil in the presence, uh, or rather in the parable I just read, the sower in the parable is a wealthy landowner, unlike last week's parable, where we heard about the 
parable of the seed and the soils. The soil in this, in this scene is all good. This field has nothing but arable fertile sto soil and the landowner, landowner should, should be able to expect a good harvest from the seeds he sows. Unfortunately, the landowner has an enemy, a rival farmer. At night after the landowner and his servants have finished sowing their seeds and have gone to bed, the rival farmer sows weed seeds. The weeds refer, re, that Jesus refers to in the parable in an older translation are called tares, T-A-R-E-S. It's also, to name the particular variety of weed, it's called bearded darnel, D-A-R-N-E-L, a poisonous weed that looks like wheat. Someone, someone is called Darnell, though a devil of a weed. It can surround the roots of, of good plants, sucking up precious nutrients and scarce water, making it impossible to root it out without damaging the good crop, the good wheat. Above ground, Darnell looks identical to wheat until it bears seed, and those seeds, that grain, well, it's poisonous. Moreover, Jesus says, this evil that's being done is intentional. Unlike the preceding story about a sower, this is not a parable about just what happens. A good seed falling onto infertile soil, as it sometimes does. Here, the enemy deliberately sows cheat, cheat weed, in a field of good wheat. And Jesus clearly here acknowledges the reality of evil, underscoring, as somebody said, both the necessity of eradicating it and the difficulty of doing so. But Jesus says, the good wheat will flourish, the righteous will flourish, and the whole creation the whole creation also knows something else as Paul develops this imagery of labor pains and the metaphor shifts. Creation strains for the coming of new life, the end of the suffering of childbirth. For creation shares in the labor pains, but they lead to God's new thing. They have in view of glorious vision for a new world, God's new world, which means that while it hurts some days to live, new life is on the way. Yes, it's a wounded world. It's broken. There's hardship, heartache, but life is stirring within it, and it will someday, that life burst onto the scene in stunning fullness and Everything that's wrong will be made right. What is sad will be undone. The forces of evil which resist God are not able to defeat God. My dad, Francis Frank, worked on aerospace, aerospace missions working for a firm in Southern California that created parts for Apollo rockets that sent people to the moon. He didn't talk about it much, certainly not around the house. He was kind of a bore down on the details kind of person. He focused on the intricacies of creating mechanical devices like a gimbal that would help an engine's aeronautic thrust. But I think sometimes knowing him as I do, that he must have also sometimes mused on the bigger picture, on the, on the broader expanse that was a backdrop and, and, an, and an overarching reality to all of the daily work he did. I wondered especially when I recently read about a shift in perception and perspective that happens to astronauts, to the people who actually go out into space and view the Earth from the vantage point of space, 
One, ast one astronaut, when interviewed, said nobody came back from space unchanged. Another one said, we went to discover the moon and well, we discovered the earth because we saw it in a new way. Strangely enough, says one writer, it's the enormous physical distance from Earth that seems to trigger feelings of emotional closeness with it. And there was this insight. Up in space, the astronauts saw anew with a fresh gaze something that had been surrounding them all along, but now had, now had more intense reality. And there's a term, in fact, for this transformative experience in space. It's called the overview effect. Paul, Paul the Apostle, helps us, helps us gain an overview effect, a larger angle of view. Seeing what's surrounding us all along from a higher vantage point helps us live amid all that surrounds us all along. Like what happened to the medieval writer, Julian of Norwich. You've, you've heard me talk about her before. She's kind of a spiritual mentor to me. And I was thrilled a few years ago when in England to see the place where she prayed, the cell where she had confined herself. Julian wrote of a vision in which, as she said, God showed a little thing the size of a hazelnut lying in the palm of my hand, as it seemed to me. And she said it was round as a ball. She said, I looked at it with my mind's eye and I thought, what can, what can this be? And the answer came in a general way. It's all that is made. She said, I wondered how it could last for it seemed to me so small that it might have disintegrated suddenly into nothingness. And she said, I was answered in my understanding. It lasts, it lasts, and always will, because God loves it. And in the same way, everything has its being through the love of God. You see, the overview effect. Julia went on to say, I saw three properties. The first is that God made it. The second is that God loves it. The third is God cares for it. The universe as though it were a mere hazelnut. God can see it all. Well, I like Julian's overview effect. It helps, doesn't it? So we watch for glimpses of glory that appear within ordinary human history that pop up in our everyday lives. Scenes of hope and light flash out. We keep our eyes peeled, our ears open. We, we pay attention to the reminders we get every day if we have eyes for them. All creation, says Paul, waits with eager longing. So can we wait with eagerness, with trust, where we look around not just at what is immediately in view, but we look up. We look ahead to what's coming. We wait and watch. We see wonders of birth and new life alongside the waiting in the midst of the pain. God's got more good things in store for his children, for you and me. And so we never, never have to give up hope. Amen. The Nicene Creed gives us, in a way, an overview effect. I invite you to join with me in saying it out loud. If you need the page reference, it's 358 in the Book of Common Prayer. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven by the 
power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead, the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the people form four. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant almighty God that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love and reveal your glory in the world. We pray for all bishops, priests and deacons, especially Justin, Archbishop, and Michael, our presiding bishop, Susan, our bishop. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good, especially Joseph, our president, Glenn, our governor. We pray for legislatures, local, statewide, national. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. We pray for first responders, medical workers, educators, those who serve in law enforcement, those serving in the military, Alex, William, Dexter, Jeremiah, Jonathan, David, Cameron. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles. Bring them the joy of your salvation. For relatives, friends, and members of our parish and beyond, Brenda, Edwina, Robert, Lucy, Melissa, Travis, Joanne, Dana, Gerald, Steve, Harold, Bill, Hilda, and Violet. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Especially, we remember Ramona Burke and her family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our concluding collect, let us say together the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. and Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. 
For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. For the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you, remain with you, now and always. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God.